This episode was pre-recorded as part of a live continuing education webinar. On-demand CEUs are still available for this presentation through all CEUs. Register at allceus.com slash counselor toolbox. I'd like to welcome everybody to today's presentation on the overview of the PACER method assessment. I am Dr. Donnelly Snipes. We're going to define the PACER model or PACER method, explore how PACER dimensions interact, and examine the transdiagnostic assessment process. Now, obviously, we've only got an hour, so we're going to scratch the surface here and see how much we can do. 10% of Americans are on antidepressants for anxiety or depressive issues. You know, so this gives us an idea that something's going on here. And, you know, without medication, 20 to 40% of people with clinical depression noticed symptom improvement in six to eight weeks. Well, that's good. percent of clinical depression noticed symptoms. People saw a benefit from medication. That's great. But that leaves as many as 40% of people still struggling with significant symptoms after six to eight weeks. Additionally, there is no high or moderate strength evidence for any intervention to effectively treat any phase of any type of bipolar disorder versus placebo or an active comparator. So basically, this is saying we have a lot of options out there, but we don't have anything that works with good certainty, and we don't have something that works for everybody. There's still 40% of the population out there, even, you know, whether it's cognitive behavioral or psychopharmacology or humanistic or whatever, is not working for them. We need to look at a new approach. Cognitive behavioral therapy appears to be effective in approximately 47% of cases, which y'all know I tend to be strongly cognitive behavioral in my approach. So when I read that, I was kind of disheartened, but, you know, at least it works well for 47% of cases. Results are mixed regarding whether cognitive behavioral therapy and antidepressants can augment the treatment response if you have them both together. CBT interventions for depression and anxiety prevention did show a small effect for prevention of depression, but not anxiety, and no effect for either one at three to six months and 12 months post-follow-up. Well, that's kind of depressing. Uh, so one of the things that tells us is the skills that and tools we may be teaching people in, in counseling, they may not be continuing to use. So we need to ask ourselves, why not? What's the hiccup here? And we also need to say, is it just their cognitions or their behaviors that are contributing to their depressive symptoms? Or is there something else? And during the initial three months when they were using the CBT techniques, they had a certain amount of hope and optimism, and maybe they were doing other things in their, in their life. So we want to look at what may be causing that improvement in the first three three months and why that improvement goes away in the after that in a study of over thirty three thousand patients only patients who had 18 to 20 sessions of cbt showed more improvement than quote generic counseling this stat i like in a certain way because it tells me or it gives me a backing when I tell interns and, and new counselors that a lot of the, the improvement that clients see in counseling is due more towards your relationship and other things than any particular technique you use. Therefore, don't get too hung up on, can I do motivational interviewing? Can I do um, DBT? Can I do EMDR? We want to figure out how to connect with the client and see the client as an individual, not as someone who needs a technique performed on them. Counseled patients are significantly more likely to have recovered than non-counseled patients. So that's good. You know, counseling does help. 
Client outcomes are most often determined by client variables, such as chronicity and severity. If you have somebody who has, you know, a major depressive disorder that's not super severe, no psychosis or anything, that person may respond differently than someone who has had, had multiple episodes of major depressive disorder that are relatively severe, or someone who has persistent depressive disorder, which we used to call dysthymia, that has been ongoing for five, six, eight years. The complexity of symptoms also affects client outcomes. If you have a client who comes in who's got pain, who's got PTSD, who's got um, fibromyalgia and diabetes, there are a lot of complexities in there that affect the potential for the outcome, especially if we are only approaching it from a talk therapy standpoint. We need to think more biopsychosocially. The client's motivation obviously impacts how effective treatment is. If they're motivated to be there and they're motivated to try different things and they're motivated to start making some changes in their life, well, then you're going to be great. If they're not motivated, if they're distracted by school and work and they're just kind of showing up for their hour and hoping that one hour works, probably not going to be really effective. I took piano when I was little. And much to my mother's chagrin, I just really didn't want to practice in between sessions. And guess what? My piano playing didn't get very much better. My motivation was really low, and my success, at the piano at least, was not so good. Same sort of thing is true for clients. We need to help them identify reasons and motivations to use these skills outside of the therapy hour. And those clients who tend to accept responsibility for change tend to be more successful, guess what, than those who don't accept responsibility and they want you to, quote, fix them or they want to take a pill and have it all magically get better. We need to examine the reasons people may not want to accept responsibility for change as well. What might be leading to that? Maybe they blame other people for their per present condition and that's one of the principles in dialectical behavior therapy other people may have done this to you but it's your responsibility to get better okay they may be afraid to try to change because they've changed before and then they've relapsed and had another major depressive episode or something and that was really overwhelming and they don't want to feel better and then fall again so to speak they may have tried to change before, and it didn't work. And whatever therapist or thing they tried was not effective, so they have a sense of hopelessness. If you go to Pro Prochaska and De Clemente's stages of readiness for change, they talk about different types of pre-contemplators, and they talk about the resistant pre-contemplator and the reluctant pre-contemplator, which can help us understand why people may not want to re accept responsibility and ways that we can help them move towards being ready to change again therapeutic change is less about talk therapy interventions and more about the patient's ability to maintain motivation and efficacy and the clinician team's ability to look at multi multi-dimensionally at issues we want to be able to have a client who's willing to do it who thinks they can do it you know they've got that i think i can motivation and the team you know, we're the, quote, experts, so to speak, multidisciplinary team. You've got maybe a, a doctor, a dietitian, a pain specialist, whomever, on, an endocrinologist for the person who's got diabetes. You know, whoever's on the team getting together and looking and going, okay, which one of the diagnoses or presenting issues this person has is contributing to their fatigue, is contributing to their cognitive decline the pacer method doesn't expect you the counselor social worker case manager whatever to be the expert on everything we aren't 
nobody is the expert on everything. The counselor functions in the PACER method are counseling and motivational enhancement. When somebody is depressed, you know, we'll just use that generic term, for a while, six months, three months, whatever, it starts affecting their perception of the world. It starts affecting their attitude. It starts affecting their thought patterns. And those things can become ingrained and perpetuate the depression. Counselors, you know, one of the things we can do is help people see the connections between things, but also, you know, address any cognitions, address their emotions, address other things that we are within our scope of practice. Counseling is definitely something we're going to do. We can help them connect with multidisciplinary referrals. When we do this transdiagnostic assessment, we're going to be looking at all the different things that might be causing this person to feel this way. And I'll keep using depression because that's one of the most common ones that we can, most people have experienced um, misdiagnoses with or inaccurate diagnoses with because they were, quote, depressed. Doctor sent them in for counseling and they went to counseling for a while, still weren't feeling any better. And lo and behold, they went back to the doctor, got a blood test done, and they had hypothyroid. Well, no amount of counseling is going to make that thyroid go up, so you can change your cognitions all you want, but that energy is still going to be in the toilet. We do want to make sure that we're assessing for any physiological causes. In the PACER method, the counselor does provide some case management, integrating and monitoring treatment plans. So you're going to get the treatment plan from the doctor and the dietitian and the physical therapist or whatever in order to just know what's going on and make sure that, you know, all of our ducks are, are swimming in a row. And we improve health and mental health literacy, so that psychoeducation component. This is nothing too out of the ordinary. The biggest change is really focusing on the biopsychosocial assessment. <clears throat> the goal is to address physical, affective, cognitive, environmental, and relationship issues which create or maintain imbalances in the nervous system that cause unnecessary dysphoria. Nobody is going to have a perfect life and be happy all the time. You know, just hang that up. Okay, people are going to feel anxious. They're going to get angry. They're going to have periods where they're grieving or they get depressed over something. That's okay. Those are normal emotions. What we're looking at is unnecessary dysphoria. The people who stay angry all the time. The people who are clinically depressed and can't seem to come out of that depression. We want to help them address their issues. The first thing we're going to do is rule out organic dysfunction in the system. Think of your system as a machine or, you know, well, let, let's go with, talk about nutrition for a minute. If the body cannot make or balance the neurotransmitters due to health or behavioral issues, we're not going to get very far. So those things must be addressed. There are over 30 hormones in the body that must be constructed to regulate the neurotransmitters. And there are, are over 100 neurotransmitters. Yes, there's more than the big five, believe it or not. More than 100 neurotransmitters the body must construct and balance to regulate attention, memory, sleep, feeding, heart rate, respiration, energy, motivation, mood, and more. A serotonin is responsible in part for all of these things. We, we need to understand that our neurotransmitters, our big five, if you want to, your glutamate, GABA, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, um, acetylcholine, I think I'm leaving out one, but, you know, your big ones are responsible for more than just your mood. You know, if you don't have dopamine, enough dopamine, you're going to be extremely fatigued. You're going to have difficulty concentrating. Your motivation is going to be low. Um, but one of the big things is the physical fatigue when there's not enough dopamine. Up to 95% of neurotransmitters and hormones are made in the gut. 
the body requires vitamins, minerals, and amino acids to make hormones and neurotransmitters. So if you have somebody who has poor health and poor nutrition, they're going to be struggling to feel better. It's kind of like trying to build a brick wall without having the mortar to keep the bricks in place or trying to run a car engine after you've already flooded it. I was trying to mow the other day. And my mower kept choking down because the, the uh, grass had gotten a little bit tall. And lo and behold, I ended up flooding the engine. So I had to wait for a while before I could mow again. The mower wouldn't run. It, it wasn't able to function as well as it should. And it wasn't able to complete the activities that it needed to. So either too little or too much of something can make the system break down. If the body can't produce or efficiently regulate hormones and neurotransmitters, people are going to have symptoms. One example would be HPA axis dysfunction and exposure to stress are critical components that increase risk for developing addictions. HPA axis, if you remember, is your stress response system. When you get stressed out, you tend to have higher heart rate, cortisol se secreted, blood glucose is dumped. Um, you know, there are a lot of physiological factors that prepare you to fight or flee. If someone is exposed to stress, then their HPA axis is going to kick off. If for some reason their HPA axis is stuck on persistent on, which we see in a lot of people who've been exposed to trauma, then they are going to feel hypervigilant. They are going to feel anxious. They are going to have trouble regulating their emotions a lot of the time, which increases risk for a lot of mental health issues as well as addictions. Because a lot of times people are trying to basically silence that HPA axis. They're trying to tone it down somehow because they can't get their body to regulate effectively. So they're trying, they end up ingesting drugs in order to try to help themselves feel better. Some hormones and neurotransmitters increase the levels of certain hormones and neurotransmitters while simultaneously decreasing levels of other hormones and neurotransmitters. For example, under stress, cortisol, your stress hormone, increases norepinephrine, adrenaline, glutamate, estrogen, and ghrelin, and ghrelin is your hunger um, hormone, and it inhibits the availability of serotonin and the creation of T3, which is one of your thyroid hormones. Under stress, cortisol does all of this, so when stress is up, it throws a bunch of other hormones and neurotransmitters into a different state. It's that fight-or-flight state. During relaxation, DHEA, GABA, and serotonin levels increase, which causes the reduction of cortisol and norepinephrine, adrenaline, glutamate, estrogen, and ghrelin. So people start to rest and digest, if you will. We want to help people enable their body to be able to do this naturally, which means we have to figure out what's triggering their... HPA access to be secreting cortisol all the time. Is it thoughts? Is it pain? Is it lack of sleep? What's going on? First thing you're going to do in the PACER assessment, P stands for physical, is talk to the person about sleep. If they're not sleeping well, that is likely going to increase their cortisol levels and throw a bunch of other stuff out of whack, so to speak. So they're more in a fight or flight state perpetually, which means they may have anxiety, they may have irritability, or at a certain point, their body just kind of throws its hands up in the air and says, this is not a fight I can win, and they start to become depressed, and um, hypocortisolism may set in. We do want to talk to them about their, their sleep. People who are depressed tend to have poor sleep. People who um, are depressed often wake up in the middle of the night and have difficulty going back to sleep. Or they want to sleep all the time, but they never feel rested. 
when we talk to people, let's figure out how are you sleeping and do you feel rested when you wake up? You can sleep, you, know, you can take a pill of various sorts and sleep for eight straight hours, but do you awake, awaken refreshed and energized or do you awaken and you still feel like you got hit by a Mack truck? The next thing we want to look at is nutrition. As I said before, your body needs a myriad of vitamins and minerals in order to break down the proteins to make the hormones and the neurotransmitters. Well, we're not dietitians. We are not going to prescribe nutrition, but I encourage people to keep an app like Spark People or some other app where they can record their nutrition on a daily basis for at least a week. And then we can look back over the app determines how, many, how much of each nutrient they got each day. And we can look back and see if there are particular nutrients that they're regularly getting less than 25% of the USRDA. Does that mean they need to start making super nutritional changes? Well, I don't know. But it could indicate that a nutritional consult might be helpful. A blood test is also helpful. Obviously, their doctor is going to do this to assess for vitamin D levels. And we know that vitamin D deficiency is associated with depression. Those are easy things to do and for, for a client to do in order to get an idea about whether the whether they have the building blocks they need to even make the system run. We want to look at weight, and this is not to fat shame or make anybody feel like they need to be a certain exact weight. We just really want to look at if they are obese. We know that excessive fatness, and that doesn't mean excessive weight. You can have somebody who's a football player and tons of muscle, and technically, according to BMI, they're obese. They're not obese. They're probably actually under fat. But if you have somebody who has more than 30% body fat, we know that that's correlated with changes in hormone levels, especially higher estrogen levels and risk factors for a lot of other problems, including diabetes, which is also linked to depression and or anxiety. And anorexia, and I use that term very generically, not the eating disorder, but someone who is way underweight. When the body is underweight, it goes into conservation. It perceives stress. The person will potentially obsess about food more, have more irritability, agitation. And if they're not eating enough or they're not eating healthfully, then the body doesn't have the building blocks to make the neurotransmitters that they need. You see where we're going. Bariatric surgery. Now, we did a class on this a couple months ago. One of the challenges with bariatric surgery, if it, they have a gastric bypass, is the fact that the intestinal length that the food has to traverse is much smaller, which means less nutrients, fewer nutrients get absorbed. So a lot of people who experience bariatric surgery, experience some changes in mood. We also have seen an increase in Korsakoff syndrome, which is caused by a deficiency of vitamin B1. It looks a lot like dementia in people who've had bariatric surgery. If there is a client that's presenting, they have low energy, they're starting to experience some cognitive decline, and they've had bariatric surgery, really important to get them in for a physical evaluation. Central weight gain. You may have people who don't really particularly look over fat or overweight, but they have a lot of weight in their belly. They've got that, they've got a belly. Belly weight gain is strongly correlated with insulin resistance, as well as high levels of persistent cortisol. So we can tell by looking at someone, possibly, that there might be excessive cortisol. There are other things that cause a big belly and weight gain, beer being one of them, um, and, and um, cirrhosis of the liver. But 
just looking at people, if you see that there's a lot of central weight gain, it may give you an idea that they tend to be stressed out a lot. And that also may be contributing to their mood issues. Pain. We need to talk with them about pain. Why? Why is pain so important? We're not pain docs. No, we're not. But people who are in pain, well, think about when you're in pain, if you've had a toothache or an earache or whatever. We tend to be not in our best mood. And pain disrupts sleep. If people can't get quality sleep, they are going to struggle because their HPA axis is going to be activated. They're going to feel fatigued. They're going to have difficulty concentrating. They're going to have apathy about a variety of things. They're basically going to feel kind of depressed when they get sleep deprived enough. And pain also, as well as a lot of other mood issues, tends to encourage people or trigger people to seek out comfort foods. We do want to look at that. Exercise and sedentariness. We want to talk to clients. Now, a lot of people don't exercise, and that's okay. I'm not saying they've got to go out and exercise, but we do know that there's a strong correlation between sedentariness and depression and anxiety. Therefore, you know, talking with them about what types of exercise they do or would be willing to do, would they be willing to move? You know, they don't have to go to the gym. They don't have to start running. Low intensity exercise, 40 to 50% of their target heart rate, 30 minutes a day. And, you know, that's really easy to get to. It's pretty much getting up and walking uh, is enough to have significant impacts on mood and oxygenation and other things. That's one area that we can explore for intervention. Exercise increases serotonin levels naturally. It increases endorphin levels naturally. A lot of people feel better after they exercise if they don't overdo it. Energy. Well, that's one of the first questions we're going to ask is, uh, maybe not the first, but what's your energy like? Do you feel fatigued all the time? And if they say yes, we want to ask them about how long that's been going on, if there was anything that precipitated it. And again, this is a great place to emphasize the need for a physical, and with that blood test that tests the vitamin D, the doctor can also test sex hormones like testosterone as well as thyroid hormones. You can develop hypo or hyperthyroid at any point in your life. It's not something that if you don't have it by 20, you're not going to get it. That's another one of those things we want to look at. If they've got low energy, but when they said when you asked them about sleep, they were pretty non-committal about anything. You might go back and explore that a little bit more. If they're willing, if they've got a fitness tracker, to if they're willing to monitor their um, light, REM, and deep sleep for a week and see what their patterns are, that might give you some indication. Obviously, they can go in for a sleep study, but those can be expensive. You know, that would be a last, sort of a last resort referral. Oxygenation is another thing that can cause people to feel fatigued. If they are anemic, which would show up in a blood test, um, it can have cause them to have low oxygenation. If they just don't breathe deeply, there are a lot of things that can contribute to low oxygenation. You can get a pulse ox monitor off of Amazon or wherever, that mo just like the one that they put on your finger at the doctor's that tells the your heart rate at that point in time and your oxygenation level at that point in time. Is it diagnostic? Oh, heck no. Is it screening? Yeah, that gives you an idea. If, if you put that on their finger and they've got a pulse ox of 84, they may want to consider going to the doctor to get an assessment to make sure everything's fine. Now, obviously, we don't want to freak them out. And quite honestly, I've never seen anybody with an 84. But... Just kind of pulling that one out of the air. The pulse ox gives you a general idea of their blood oxygenation as well as their resting heart rate. If their resting heart rate is really low and they're not an avid exerciser, that could be another indication that 
they might want to go get evaluated by a physician if they haven't been within a year or so. Now, I'm an avid exerciser. My resting heart rate is somewhere between 48 and 53. That's not a big deal for me. For, you know, somebody who hasn't ever exercised in their life, that might be a little low. That also, low heart rate can also point to not only potential neurotransmitter disruptions like low dopamine, low serotonin, but also low thyroid. Ask people about their libido, and this is to get at their level of their sex hormones. If their libido has changed, that may indicate that their testosterone is low or their estrogen is too low or too high. Why do we care? Well, you know, most people want to have a decent libido, but testosterone and estrogen also make serotonin more available. When your estrogen levels are down, serotonin is less available. Same thing with testosterone, which is another reason, you know, if somebody has low serotonin and we start throwing, or the doctor starts throwing SSRIs at them, yeah, that'll increase their serotonin level, but it doesn't address the underlying issue of why was their serotonin low in the first place? Oh, because their testosterone was low. Oh, who knew? Sometimes when they get their sex hormones balanced out or their thyroid hormones balanced out, they don't need the um, antidepressant anymore. And we want to talk to people about blood sugar and hypoglycemia. And most people have no idea. How's your blood sugar been? I don't know. Put it to them as, do you ever get periods where, you know, a couple hours after you eat, you start feeling really shaky and maybe lightheaded? And if they say yes, then that might indicate that they have some hypoglycemia. Does that mean that they are necessarily pre-diabetic? No. Does that necessarily mean there's anything major wrong? No. Um, one interesting presentation that I went to, the doctor was talking about how kids, our, our blood is the, sorry, our brain is the biggest user of blood glucose and kids who are gifted tend to think really fast and think a lot and they tend to burn through their blood glucose. So they tend to have more hypoglycemic issues, you know, in the middle of the period between breakfast and lunch and the middle of the period between lunch and going home, which tends to make them have more behavioral problems at school. And when they controlled for that and provided adequate, appropriate snacks for those children, their uh, behavioral issues went down or disappeared completely. Hypervigilance and startle. We want to ask people about whether they startle really easy. When somebody has trauma in their history, they may be hypervigilant and they may always be on edge and they may startle really easily. People who have hypocortisolism, who tend to be sort of depressed a lot of the time, but then when they get startled, they jump out of their skin. That's another indication that cortisol levels are out of balance. We all startle sometimes, but if you're one of those people who's regularly getting startled, for, and other people aren't. It might be something to look at. Autoimmune issues and inflammation, including rheumatoid arthritis, irritable bowel syndrome, diabetes type 1, psoriasis, Crohn's disease, the list goes on. Why do we care? Inflammation has repeatedly been shown to be associated with depression. And the mechanisms of that are far beyond the scope of today's presentation. However, we do know that people who have higher levels of inflammation have a much higher risk of having concurrent depress depressive issues. Likewise, if you're working with somebody and they come in and they're like, you know, I'm depressed all the time, yada, yada, if we don't address those autoimmune issues and get them under control, then they're going to struggle to feel better. We wanted to ask people about traumatic brain injury. A lot of stuff happens in our head. And a lot of times, especially in car accidents or football, uh, the injury to the brain can be to the prefrontal cortex, 
which is where our higher order learning and our impulse control and all that stuff is. But there are other areas of the brain that can get injured when it bounces around in your skull. We want to assess whether anybody's had traumatic brain injury, which could have caused damage to part or parts of their brain. It doesn't mean that there's not a workaround. It just means that's one of those th contributing factors we want to look at. We want to talk to people about whether they're having headaches. If they have um, a lot of stress headaches, we want to take a look at that. What's causing those? I have TMJ, and when I get stressed, I grind my teeth, and I tense my neck, and then I get a stress headache. Go figure. Um, if somebody does that a lot, you know, it's going to impact their sleep. It's going to impact their mood. It's going to, you know, do a whole lot of things. Helping them become more mindful of when they are clenching their jaw or tightening their muscles and developing skills to release that is going to be really helpful. People who have migraines. Migraines have been related to uh, dopamine levels, among other things, um, as well as sex hormone levels. Migraines can be extraordinarily debilitating, and they're not just headaches. Helping people figure out, um, you know, maybe what triggers their migraine and how to cope with their migraines, as well as looking at medications they may be taking for their migraines, which could be impacting their mood. And high blood pressure or low blood pressure can cause headaches. Low blood Low blood pressure tends to cause more dizziness and confusion. High blood pressure, you tend to have more of a headache and see spots in front of your eyes. If people report that they have a lot of headaches and they're seeing spots, have them get their blood pressure checked. Don't even have to go to the doctor. They can go down to the local pharmacy and put their arm in one of those cuffs. Or if you've got a cuff handy, you can test it there, but how many different gadgets are we going to have for an assessment? Medications. The list of medications goes on and on, but some of the more common ones that affect people's mental health include beta blockers, which are prescribed for high blood pressure, proton pump inhibitors, which are prescribed for gastric reflux, corticosteroids like um, prednisone, which are often prescribed for things like rheumatoid arthritis, Parkinson's and antipsychotic medications, which affect levels of dopamine. Hormone-altering drugs, anything that alters testosterone or estrogen is also going to alter the levels of serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine. Stimulants, and this can include anything from decongestants for people who are really sensitive to your ADHD medications or illicit drugs. Anticonvulsants are sometimes prescribed for bipolar disorder or pain, but they are going to alter neurotransmitter levels, and they target certain neurotransmitters, but when those neurotransmitters go up and down, they're going to alter the levels of the other ones. Statins, interestingly enough, which are prescribed for high cholesterol, can alter neurotransmitter levels. Opioids. We know their depressants, their system depressants, Benzodi and benzodiazepines. When people take benzodiazepines, it may make them feel depressed because it's increasing levels of GABA in the system, which is reducing levels of glutamate and uh, norepinephrine. People also experience, some, a lot of people also report experiencing rebound anxiety when their benzo is wearing off and they feel like they're going to crawl out of their skin, which can be problematic, which leads them, a lot of times leads them to take another pill, but then they get stuck in this persistent cycle. And finally, substance use and potentially addictive behaviors. Any addictions are going to increase when, when you're using them, they're going to increase dopamine, serotonin, uh, and and endogenous opioids. They're going to be rewarding. They're going to be pleasurable. When you're flooding the brain that much with that much dopamine and serotonin and opioids, eventually the brain starts to change to protect itself from being flooded all of the time, which is going to lead people to feel depressed, apathetic, 
and sometimes anxious when they're not using because they're not getting that extra hit, if you will, of dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. And these behaviors, it's not just illicit drugs. It can be viewing pornography, sexual addiction, gambling, video games, you know, and then obviously your, your drugs and your illicit drugs. So, wow, get all the way through the physical. And there is a lot of stuff that can be ruled in or ruled out. Diabetes, high blood pressure, um, coronary artery disease, fibromyalgia, low, um, thyroid imbalances, and the list goes on, of different physical conditions that can have symptoms that are similar and or cause mood disorders. We want to make sure we're addressing the person, making sure their body is functioning well enough to balance those neurotransmitters on their own. So when they finally address the issues in their relationships, their environment, their cognitions, etc., that they will be able to experience symptom remission. An affective assessment. You know, we're going to ask them about on an average day, how happy are you? You know, how often do you feel happy? And then we'll talk about sadness, depression, loneliness, grief, stress, anxiety, anger, resentment, guilt, jealousy. A lot of times what I have people do is if keep a log for a week or they don't have to. They can just guess while they're in, in, in the office. And I say, I want you to put a percent next to each one of these emotions what percent of every week do you spend feeling this way and then you know it has to add up to a hundred percent and they start seeing that oh you know i'm not spending a whole lot of time being happy and we identify targets for their treatment um, that can help them start feeling happier one of the things that i do during that first assessment is we identify triggers and things that make them happy. And I say, you know what? You can eliminate all the unpleasantness that you want, but until you start adding in some of the happy, you're still going to be living in this kind of gray world. Let's add some color. Start doing something every day this week that's going to make you happy, even if it's just for 10 minutes. That also helps increase serotonin and endogenous um, opioids. But uh, I digress. Affective assessment. Uh, dysphoric emotions typically impair sleep quality, excite the HPA axis, reduce pain tolerance, prompt cravings for high carbohydrate foods, and a lot of other things. As I said earlier, our dysphoric emotions, I try not to use negative because they're not negative. They are natural emotions that our body experiences and it's trying to tell us something it may not be right but it's trying to tell us something when people experience those emotions accepting them you know using that radical acceptance and then saying okay where is this coming from and what can i do to start feeling better you can ask people in an average week how much time is spent on each emotion like we just talked about what triggers each emotion and you know People are going to have different triggers for anger and resentment and those sorts of things. But we can start looking at the laundry list of things that we may need, may be able to start working off, you know, if they have a lot of resentment triggers. Well, we can start whittling away at those so they're not holding on to those triggers. What stressors are currently present? What stressors have you experienced in the past 12 months? Why 12 months? Well, number one, when we talk about grief and loss, we say at least 12 months for people to start getting into the rhythm of their new normal. When we experience stressors, it wears us down a little bit. When we repeatedly experience stressors, it keeps whittling away at our energy and, and things like that a lot of times. If somebody's had a lot of stressors in the past 12 months, they're going to have a whole lot less reserve than somebody who has had very few stressors and has had a great year most of us have had those years where the year was 
we had one of those years it's just like i can't wait for the year to be over just one thing after another and then other years that were not so problematic and the years that were not so problematic a lot of times we tended to feel like we had a lot more energy what's different and, and past stressors we can't change but we can all we can help people recognize that you know what you may need need a minute to take a breath here because you've gone through a lot and you've dealt with it you've gotten to this point you've survived that's awesome but wow how much energy did that take ask people what's different when they're happy let's start recreating that situation think back when to, when you were happy what was different did you you know work in the garden did you go to the gym every day okay those are mine but <laughs> what was it and figure out what parts of that that you can start recreating to create an environment that nurtures happiness and how long does it take for you to calm down after you get upset this gives us an idea about emotional dysregulation and whether the person may need some distress tolerance tools Cognitive assessment, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, oxytocin, and estrogen imbalances can all cause cognitive dysfunction. Oh my gosh. You know, let that sink in for a second. Oxytocin is our bonding hormone. Who knew that that could cause cognitive dysfunction? Problems with memory and attention and slowing of thought and stuff. If any of those are out of whack, and I'm sure there are others that are not listed there, uh, then we may have more difficulty thinking clearly and doing our daily activities cognitions cause biological emotional and behavioral changes which throw hormones and neurotransmitters into that stress stratosphere um, and impact the mind body relationships and environment when you're stressed out when you are being a negative ned and you're having these negative cognitions and you know paranoia not clinical paranoia but you know you see everything as a um conspiracy and you know I, I see it a lot right now it affects not only the way you think about things the way you perceive other people but your mood and your energy levels that's really exhausting to be in that negative place where you are perceiving so many things as a threat oh my gosh how exhausting is that we want to help people look at their cognitions and evaluate them for things like all or nothing thinking and catastrophizing and you know, the list goes on on the other hand you've got positive pete who puts on his rose-colored glasses and says all right you know this thing over here is kind of going sucky right now but these 17 things over here are going great and this one thing that's not going so well let me look and identify what parts of it i can change and leave the rest up to you know somebody else who can change it positive pete tends to generally have more energy tends to generally have healthier relationships tends to generally have less pain less anxiety less problems with sleep we also want to assess people's functioning cognitively in terms of their attention and their concentration you can get an idea of that when they're in session but they may tell you i can't seem to focus on anything for more than half a second right now okay uh, what's your memory like you know are you having difficulty remembering what you just did are you having difficulty problem solving or processing information and for all of these things whether it's physical emotional cognitive and the list goes on we want to look at and how is this different for you when when did this start get an idea about the chronicity of the problem if they've always had memory problems that's going to be less of a warning flag than if they say you know over the past three months i can't seem to remember anything then you're going to look back and look for other things when people are going through chemotherapy they call it chemo brain because they have difficulty with memory and um, problem solving and they tend to think a little bit more slowly right after you have a baby a lot of us call it mommy mind or baby brain because you're not getting enough sleep so you're having difficulty with thinking and memory and as I said earlier people who are clinically anorexic 
who have had bariatric surgery or who are alcoholic um, are all at risk for Korsakoff syndrome, which is caused by a uh, thiamine deficiency, and it will be reflected in attention, memory, and problem solving. We want to get an idea if there's anything organic going on there. We can also provide people with um, tips and tools to help them. If there's nothing organic going on, or even if there is, how can we help you with your attention and concentration? We want to assess cognitive HPA axis triggers. What thoughts are you having that are triggering your stress response? What kinds of negative attitudes and perceptions do you have? And these can be learned responses. We see a lot of more HPA, HPA axis triggering thoughts in people who have a history of trauma, which is most people. Okay, you know, from a psychodynamic perspective, we can say that was really traumatic. Now let's look at the difference between what's going on here now and what happened back then. And is this stress response really necessary? People who have lack of hardiness, a lack of a sense of commitment, control, and challenge tend to get upset and get anxious easier. If they don't feel like they have any control over their life or they see life very unidimensionally, and when that one dimension starts going badly, they feel like throwing their hands up in the air. If they have an extreme locus of control, too external, where they think they have no control over anything, can be really stressful. Too internal, where they think they need to control or they can control everything, can also be really stressful. We want to look at, you know, do they have a good sense of what they can and cannot control? Address those, that list of cognitive distortions. Listen for negative self-talk if they're constantly berating themselves, shooting themselves, that sort of thing. And then talk with them about their time management. I didn't really know where else to put time management, but the way you conceptualize and use your time has a big effect on your ability to think clearly, your emotion of feeling overwhelmed, your ability to get enough sleep, etc. And relationships. Oops, I skipped right over environmental. Environmental. Safety. If people don't feel safe, they're always going to have an HPA axis, a stress response system that is in the stratosphere. We want to make sure that they feel safe. And if they don't feel safe somewhere, emotionally or physically, where is it? Why don't you feel safe? And, you know, what can be done about it? They've shown repeatedly that people are ex who are exposed to noise whether it's ambient noise from traffic or if you live in an apartment complex and you hear your neighbors all night long, noise, exposure to noise when you don't want to be exposed to it or when you're trying to sleep contributes to high levels of anxiety, aggression, and depression. Light. We've talked about this a lot before. People need to be able to be in the light during the day so their brain knows to be awake and to be exposed to the dark at night so they can sleep. Any amount of light is going to start messing with the pineal gland and the brain might not realize that it's sleep time, which can affect melatonin levels. In our culture if of, of electronic devices, blue light also tricks the pineal gland into thinking that, hey, guess what? It's still daytime outside. Encouraging people to start using blue light filters and detaching from electronic devices uh, two hours before bed is helpful. Smells. Talk about smells in the, their environment. When you're at work, when you're at home, what smells are you exposed to that are noxious, that ugh, turn your stomach, that give you a headache? All of those things can contribute to stress. What smells do you smell that are triggering? People who have a history of trauma, it might trigger, you know, certain smells might trigger certain feelings, you know, encouraging them to be cognizant, cognizant of those and having a plan for how to deal with them. There are also 
smells that are triggering for positive feelings. And hey, let's increase those. If you like right now, you know, pumpkin spice, I'm sorry, y'all, I love it, um, and caramel. Fall comes around, I start putting my little tarts in the wall and it just smells amazing and that makes me happy. Then there are assistive smells that people can be exposed to that are purported to help with insomnia, sleep, anxiety, pain, depression, and cortisol levels. A lot of those are essential oil type um, aromas. Air pollution can contribute to people's negative mood. Carbon dioxide and nitrous oxides are put out by cars. They can reduce our level of oxygenation, contribute to confusion, lethargy, etc. Tobacco smoke also can contribute to some mood issues as well as carbon monoxide in the home. Carbon monoxide poisoning, again, is another thing that looks a lot like dementia. And finally, temperature. If you're too hot or you're too cold, you're going to typically be in a stressed state. So your HPA axis is going to go, okay, we're too hot, we need to do something, or we're too cold, we need to do something, which is going to contribute to, you know, excessive activation of that system and unbalancing of your, your, what you want to call your steady state hormones and neurotransmitters. And finally, relationships. You know, that's the R in PACER. Talk with people about their self-esteem and their self-efficacy. We want to make sure they have a relationship with themselves as capable, lovable, and deserving. Most people, when they come into counseling, don't. But some do, but most don't. And that's one of those places where we want to start with helping them develop their social support system within themselves, where they can be their own cheerleader and go, you got this, or you're lovable even though you made a mistake. We want to assess their attachment style, whether they're securely attached in their adult relationships or if you're working with a child or child relationships, but really we're talking a lot about adults here today. Why? Because attachment style impacts oxytocin levels, your bonding hormone, serotonin, dopamine, and endogenous opioids. A lot of your feel-good chemicals are affected by attachment. If you don't feel securely attached in your adult life, then you may struggle with abandonment fears and a lot of anxiety. Boundaries. Does the person have the ability to set and maintain healthy emotional and physical boundaries? Are they able to effectively identify and communicate their feelings and thoughts and get their needs met? If not, you know, communication skills, we can work with that. Do they have a good social support system? And a good social support system is one that is relatively healthy, they're accessible, and they can provide functional support when it's needed, like a ride to the doctor, or emotional support when it's needed. And I put animals and pets here too because, you know, my critters are part of my family. But what is your relationship, you know, with your animals? If you just had your, the dog that you've had for 15 years die, you know, yeah, you might be devastated right now, which could be contributing to grief and sleep disruption and all kinds of things. So I do want to know about your relationships with those entities or beings, not necessarily just human, that are important in your life. Our current uni or bi-dimensional approach, where we look at either using medication or just counseling or just medication plus counseling to treat mood disorders doesn't work for the majority of people. There are a myriad of underlying causes of distress, and most people have multiple contributing factors. If your air conditioning bill was suddenly ridiculously high, would you pull down the blinds? What impact would that have? What Would it solve the whole problem? And, you know, I struggle with that at my house. It's settling right now, and there tends to be some air per permeation. So no, just pulling down the blinds ain't going to solve the whole problem. We need to look at what's causing the sudden air penetration. Would you turn up the AC so it didn't run as often and pull down the blinds? Well, that's two things. What impact is that going to have? Well, it might help some, 
but it's probably still not going to address the issue of why are we suddenly having higher electrical bills and air intrusion. We want to look at the big picture. A transdiagnostic approach works to identify all of the causes of symptoms, understand their interrelationship and their causes, and develop a multidimensional treatment plan based on what the client is most motivated to address. If they want to address their apathy, if they want to address their sleep, if they want to, what, it, what is it that you want to address right now? And let's look at the, all the possible things that we could start tapping into to help you start making progress in that area. Between writing notes, filing insurance claims, and scheduling with clients, it can be hard to stay organized. That's why I recommend Therapy Notes. Their easy-to-use platform lets you manage your practice securely and efficiently. Visit TherapyNotes.com to get two free months of Therapy Notes by just using the promo code CEU when you sign up for a free trial at TherapyNotes.com. If this podcast helps you help your clients or yourself, please support us by purchasing your CEUs at allceus.com or getting your agency to sponsor an episode. A direct link to the on-demand CEUs for this podcast is at allceus.com slash podcast CEUs. That's allceus.com slash podcast CEUs. To sponsor an episode of Counselor Toolbox and reach over 50,000 clinicians per week, go to allceus.com slash sponsor. Thank you.